My guest today is somebody I've known for a little while. We go a little ways back. That's because he's my dad. This is Professor Sheldon Namod, uh, who has been a professor for how many years, Dad? Um, teaching really for 50 years, something like that. 50 years. Uh, you are currently an Emeritus Distinguished Professor right. at Chicago Kent College of Law. Uh, you graduated college, University of Chicago, law school, Harvard Law, um, and uh, then started working at Chicago Kent in downtown Chicago 45 years ago. Um, in 1977, 78. Right. Right, so we, the family moved to Chicago and you started teaching there in downtown Chicago and uh, continued and actually still continue to this day teaching there. Where I teach one course a year. I'm technically emeritus, retired as of 2018, as you mentioned. Your specialty is constitutional law and specifically section 1983. Uh, which I've done a little bit of research. Uh, I'm embarrassed to say that I didn't do it 30 years ago, uh, but Section 1983... Better late, better late than never. <laughs> <laughs> Section 1983 is a law passed in 1871, um, but not really practically applied, it seems like, or maybe even ever referenced by the Supreme Court for 60 years or 70 years after that. Um, um, right. Right. So middle, could, actually, until the, the 50s or so. Right. So could you just really briefly uh, uh, describe what Section 1983 uh, was written to do? Sure. Uh, you have to go back really to the 14th Amendment, because the 14th Amendment uh, not only overruled that infamous Dred Scott case, which said that uh, African-Americans could never be citizens. Uh, this was before the Civil War, obviously. Uh, but uh, the 14th Amendment also has uh, the due process clause and the equal protection clause and uh, it's a due process, major, due due process, process means what well due process we don't want to get off too much on yeah. on that but due process uh has a procedural component a fair trial uh, uh aspect to it and fair also trial. what they call a substantive component in fact as it turns out and again we don't want to get too far afield it turns out that the uh, right to an abortion uh, and similar constitutional rights, uh, they are based on the due process clause. Uh, okay. that, that, that took uh, generations uh, to happen. And the Equal Protection Clause is really what the Civil War was all about because the 13th Amendment, everybody will remember, abolished uh, involuntary servitude and slavery. And the 14th Amendment um, prohibits racial discrimination, ultimately held to prohibit sex discrimination, gender mm -hmm. discrimination, uh, and the like. Mm -hmm. So okay. why did I talk about the 14th Amendment? Because Congress can't enact legislation like Section 1983 unless uh, it has power to do it. The 14th Amendment gives Congress the power. Yeah. Uh, so what this does really is say, in order to make the 14th Amendment effective, we're going to create a damages remedy against state and local governments and against mm -hmm. state and local government officials and employees when they violate your constitutional rights, your 14th Amendment rights, they can be held liable and damages. I view the 14th Amendment in Section 1983 as covenantal, in the sense that if you are a, a, a decent citizen of the United States, the government will protect you in certain respects and certainly not cause you any harm in terms of the deprivation of your constitutional rights. So this goes all the way back uh, to 1871. Section mm -hmm. 1983. Mm -hmm. When you say damages, does that mean money? Yes, it means money damages. Exactly right. The right to sue the state if the state harms me. Yeah, it gets a little more technical than that because Arse. it turns Arse. out you can't sue the state, but you might be able to sue a municipality. I'm in Chicago, right. uh, so we might be able to sue a city. We might be able to sue a local. We can sue a city. Uh, uh, a city's employees or officials, law enforcement officers and the like. And even though we can't sue a state for technical reasons, we can sue a state officials and employees for damages uh, individually. Look, the point of damages here is the same as the point of damages uh, in areas that we're all familiar with, the tort law, personal injuries, 
driving and the like. The idea is to compensate somebody for harm caused and also to regulate conduct, to deter. So just as that's true for driving carefully Mm -hmm. and compensating somebody uh, whom you've injured by your negligent driving, the same thing is true with respect to state and local governments and their officials and employees. There is nothing about this subject that is outdated or obsolete. I mean, is there a more current subject? Look, if uh, uh, all those cases that we have seen, some very tragic indeed, involving excessive use of force, alleged excessive use of force by Mm -hmm. law enforcement officers, and the law enforcement officers and their cities are sued, those are 1983 cases. When government officials or employees, believe it or not, are fired, because say they have exercised their free speech rights, they've blown the whistle. Those are First Amendment cases. Uh, Those are 1983 cases as well. This is powerful stuff. Let me put it this way. As wide ranging as the Constitution is, that's as wide ranging as Section 1983 is. So even if your folks are not that uh, interested in or conversant with the technicalities of this long ago federal civil rights statute, that's Mm -hmm. really what's at stake. It's constitutional accountability and constitutional compliance. It occurs to me to ask, this was this was passed in 1871. Um, Jim Crow and terrible, if not state sanctioned violence, but certainly state ignored violence against black people carried on for decades after that. How could there never have been a lawsuit against a city police force for looking the other way during a lynching, for example? Well, let me back up just for a second. Uh, Section 1983, as you said, as we said, was enacted in 1871. Lincoln uh, had been killed in 1865. Andrew Johnson, who was uh, at the very least incompetent uh, and and more realistically, he was a racist and a drunkard and he was sympathetic to the South. Right. So he was fighting against the Republicans at that time who were engaged in reconstructing the South, trying to bring the South back. And part of that was to uh, uh, provide much better political clout to uh, slaves and to former slaves and and their sympathizers. In reaction to that, we had the Ku Klux Klan. The Ku Mm -hmm. Klux Klan uh, developed in large part in reaction at that point to reconstruction area. Fast forward a couple of years. Uh, Johnson loses the presidency in 1868 and Ulysses S. Grant uh, becomes president and fights the Ku Klux Klan and virtually destroys it, Mm -hmm. uh, uh, both in terms of uh, soldiers, the military. Uh, Remember he was one of the uh, main generals, if you will, in the Civil War for the North. And he also enacted and got into the Republican uh, Congress to enact legislation very much like Section 1983. So that's the background. What really happened in terms of why Section 1983 was not uh, used much until the middle of the 20th century, constitutional law had not really developed very much in terms of racial discrimination, Mm -hmm. due process, and the like until the mid 20th century. Wow. So it was dormant. Mm-hmm. It was dormant. So since the 14th Amendment was pretty much dormant, so too was Section 1983. And that began to change uh, near the middle 20th century, as I mentioned. And some, some people will remember the Warren Court beginning with 1954. Brown against Board of Education. In fact, that's a very good example. Racial discrimination was never really actionable because of Jim Crow until Brown against Board of Education in 1954. Look how long that was after the Civil War, almost 100 years. So that's an example of why Section 1983 was so very uh, dormant because the Constitution had not really developed much in terms of civil rights and civil liberties until the middle 20th century. 
do you consider yourself like a, a student of a student and teacher of law or do you maybe it's clearly not an and or but do you or do you consider yourself an activist on behalf of civil rights in the in, in playing the, through the role of teacher and and lawyer right well my my view of uh, an academic is fairly traditional in other words uh, i believe in political neutrality i will never uh, take a politically partisan view in mm -hmm. the classroom. If students want to ask me about this uh, after class, uh, I don't make any secret about it, but I do my damnedest mm -hmm. to make sure that I am as neutral as possible for obvious educational reasons. One is you want to be able to push back against arguments on all sides. All for sides. another, you don't want to chill students uh, whose views may not agree with uh, with yours. And students, even in law school, sometimes are chilled and are, re are very reluctant uh, to speak out uh, on their views. Let me give you a simple example of affirmative action. There are arguments for and against affirmative action constitutionally. I make sure my students will are able to articulate the arguments for and against, uh, the responses and the like. If uh, they want to talk about policy considerations, that's fine as well. Same thing with abortion. You get the idea. The way I teach is uh, a neutral, hopefully, and rigorous, regardless. Maybe old-fashioned these days. Uh, yeah. I do not know, but I think that's the way uh, teachers at the higher uh, educational level should uh, do it. Now, let me take a step back and say, if you think that Section 1983 uh, was and is and should be a vital right statute this is more which what is, I'm asking. yeah which is my position right i don't make any secret about that i i think that there indeed ought to be compensation for constitutional harms caused by state and local government officials and the like uh i don't make any secret about that right but just, to, just to nail this a little bit more uh your audience should know that i do a uh, fair amount of consulting I have over the years, and I will consult for plaintiff's lawyers, yeah. and I will consult for state and local governments and police officers as well. As long as there's a respectable argument right. to be made, I have no ideological ax to grind. Do you encounter somebody who, who enters your sphere of expertise, but is actually uh, a, an, a non-fan of Section 1983, somebody who wants it to be less influential, hold less sway? I mean, are there people who want in the law, there, actually, of course, there must be people who sure. want police officers to be more protected, not less, or cities yeah. to be less suable, not more, right? That's an excellent question. And it gives rise to uh, uh, my favorite F word, and that yeah. F word is federalism. The idea is, if you keep in mind that Section 1983 is, first of all, a federal statute, and secondly, usually enforced by federal courts, you can begin to see how federalism comes in because uh, many respectable thinkers believe that the federal judiciary should not use federal law to intervene supervise state and local governments <laughs> and their officials and employees so that despite everything I've said about the purposes of Section 1983, they would rather have less judicial protection right. uh, than more. What's their response to the question of whether uh, the people have suffered constitutional harms and don't get compensated? They argue, well, you can go to state law that's not a very powerful argument uh, for lots of technical reasons. They can go to state law, state and local governments can set up compensation funds and the like, but, uh, but the federal courts should not be overwhelmed with this sort of stuff. Respectable arguments, I think those are wrongheaded. Uh, those are the arguments that are being made. And in fact, if I may say so, uh, we have all been reading in the last uh, year or so in particular about uh, again, tragic examples of police misconduct, the least alleged, the United States Supreme Court 
has cut police officers a tremendous amount of slack. Right. A much more slack than in my view, and I've been working on this stuff for 40, 45 years. I think the Supreme Court has in an unwarranted fashion cut police officers too much slack. So yeah, that it's taking, almost as if they are absolutely immune. Right. You say in your blog that that's a recent trend, the last 10, 15, 20 years. Yes. Yeah. yes. Yeah. And it ties in to uh, so-called conservative justices in right. the ascendancy on the Supreme Court who would be very uh, sensitive to federalism concerns and not oh, having the I federal see. judiciary intervene, intervene or interfere. And they, they might to use a term from way back when, they might be more law and order types who might want police officers to have a little more discretion to act in certain ways uh, not necessarily to be abusive, not necessarily to cause harm in an egregious situation, but if they make a mistake, they make a mistake. We all make mistakes. Let's right. not hit them with damages liability. You went to University of Chicago, a very you know, kind of intellectually rigorous place. Then you went to Harvard Law School, you know, kind of regarded as the finest or certainly one of the finest law one schools them, right? in the world. Um, what, when did you, um, you know, I, I remember when I was in college, I remember when I took, I took a uh, Economics 101 and Economics 102, right? Mac, microeconomics and then macroeconomics. Right. The two professors were so spectacularly interesting mm. that I found myself much more interested in economics than I ever thought I would be and ended up majoring in it, right? So you're in, you're in college, University of Chicago, you were already... Um, I, I imagine al always a top student, right? I worked always, hard. And I always worked hard. Yeah, right. I always worked hard. Right. So there are, other, there are other people around, lots of them who are much smarter than I am. I'm not putting myself down, believe I me. I understand. Uh, not much smarter and might even be, uh, well, incredibly smart, geniuses and the like. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you wouldn't categorize yourself as that, but you were always a I hard worker. I never even thought in those terms. I figured right. that I could always, by hard work, keep up with 99% uh, of them. So University of Chicago was fairly close to where you grew up, right? Right. physically. Um, how far or close was it to where you grew up kind of uh, sociologically? I mean, was it, were you expected to go, were you expected to be an intellectual? Were you expected to be a thinker? Were you expected to go to a, a, a world-class university? And how, how did that play out? Uh, nothing, nothing really like uh, that, as you know, uh, I am a first generation American. You know, your grandparents, right. uh, my parents were, uh, my dad came from Syria, my mother came from, from Poland. So I was born here in the United States. And the idea was uh, for me to get as, as good of an education as I could get. My elementary uh, school background and my high school background uh, confirmed that education was very important. And I don't know, it just might have sunk in somehow that I could go pretty far just by doing well in school. You might call me a nerd, but not really because I was into sports and the like as, as well. In any event, fast forward from high school to the University of Chicago, which some of our audience might know is a kind of, used to be in my day, great book school. In other words, we had no textbooks or very few textbooks. I remember only one textbook in wow. four years of college, which was in uh, calculus. But we did original readings, everything. If you were talking about uh, psychology, you read Freud, sociology, Durkheim, uh, uh, mm -hmm. physics. You read Newton and Galileo. You get the idea, it was all yes. original readings. It yes. was awesome, but it was a liberal arts education, a classical liberal arts education. And um, uh, again, it kept me interested and involved and I kept uh, doing as well as I could because, frankly, compared to high school, college was awesome. It was just awesome. I loved every second uh, at the University of Chicago. Wow. And when, when I was looking around for something to do, I was a so-called poli-sci major, but I wanted to do something that involved people, but that was also stimulating intellectually, and that was a profession. Uh, never really thought about 
being a doctor because my high school education was so woefully inadequate when mm -hmm. it came to the sciences. It's scary how much that can affect you in your future uh, years. Uh, yeah. So I decided to apply to law school uh, and I got in out east and um, loved it as well. Not as much as I loved the University of Chicago because Harvard Law School was and is a very big place. You can get lost there, whereas you have really college. Big means what? Like like physically big or lots of kids? I mean, both. I know is big. Both, especially the number of students. For example, uh, 1,500 students. I had no idea. 1,500 and there were four sections. So did you know anybody? I mean, nobody. You knew nobody at Harvard Law School. Nobody. Exactly you, right. And there were yeah. rich kids. They were rich, well-to-do kids, not surprisingly, very much different from me. You were not a rich kid. Never. Right. Right. So did you feel, you know, I, I even hear now, I mean, you know, that there's, there's even now there's like a financial divide um, that people think, people think, oh, you got a scholarship to a great school. Good for him. But then you get there and other kids have the fancy iPods or the right or the fancy iPhones or the fancy clothes or go to the mall on weekends and you don't have that money. Uh, so did you feel like an outsider um, financially um, when well, you were there? It didn't affect me at all in okay. terms of the education, but obviously there were some rich kids there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And they were talking that many of them had cars. Right. And uh, after the first year, you could live in, a, uh, in your own apartment. Right. Uh, and people did that. And I heard the way they were talking. The Kentucky Derby was big. Kentucky Derby parties were very big. <laughs> right, yeah. right. Horse, horse people. The horse right. people, people who were... Right. I'm very interested in that. Yeah, I mean, what was it? Was it then what it is now? I mean, I, I imagine you don't go to Harvard Law School without essentially a straight A average and, you know, impeccable credentials. I do not know. Uh, my guess is the way things have been going, I would not get into Harvard Law School now with my then credentials. Okay. Okay. I mean, look, the competition is so tough. Whoever thought about taking uh, classes for the law school aptitude exam in advance? Right. Nobody. Right ever thought of that stuff. Uh, my parents would never have thought about that. My parents never even knew about that. And most parents in those days probably didn't, although I'm guessing they were well-to-do people who were on top of all of this stuff. Sure, sure. But I never, I never knew them and it didn't make any difference to me. I just put my head down and uh, did the grind and did the hard work and didn't worry about what anybody else was doing. Did your, did your parents know what Harvard was? Not really. Did they no, not really did they care then or come to care? Oh, they were proud of it. Sure. Okay. Uh, uh, my mother, who uh, had a weird sense of humor, uh, yeah. talked about her son, the liar. The liar instead Against of the lawyer. the lawyer. You remember that? Yeah, she always said, Danny, you're going to be a liar like your dad. Yeah. Right. Something like that. Right. Uh, so I'm sure they were proud. I was the first uh, in, my, in my generation. I had a lot of older cousins. I was the first person to go to college, much less law school, and right. much less University of Chicago and Harvard Law School. So when you're at Harvard Law School, there are, I mean, I, I think, aren't there, in the, in the field anyway, celebrity professors? In other words, there are prominent people teaching there, coming through their lecture, I would think, and guests speak. Frankly, uh, I found out how famous these folks were for what they had accomplished from my fellow students. Again, I'm an unsophisticated kid coming in there from Chicago, first generation American. And these kids knew, my, many of my classmates knew who they were and they were in awe. I probably didn't know enough to be in awe. They were in awe, them. right. And right. some of them with very good reputations were terrible teachers, by the way. Sure, sure. Of course, terrible uh, uh, <laughs> teachers. And some of them with, you know, reputations uh, as scholars that were 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 fine, uh, were incredible. One very nice moment I will never forget. This I was I did okay at Harvard Law School, but not uh, at or near the top of the class, but very respectably. Uh, but in my second year of law school, uh, I was as always preparing, and a tax professor, uh, Ernie Lee, as a matter of fact. Uh, he called on me. This is very interesting. I don't think I've ever told you or anybody else about this. Maybe I have. Um, he called on me 
uh, with a question and I had just prepared for that. They just called on me cold. Law schools are cold calls very often. Uh, he asked me a question and I gave him an answer and he said, thank you, Mr. Neymar. And we went on. The following morning, uh, he started class by saying very quietly, uh, and thanks to Mr. Neymar for his very insightful response. I didn't even hear it, he was so quiet. And a, couple, a guy next to me nudged me and said, he's complimenting you. And this was early in the semester, whoever, second year, whoever knew that I'd uh, be interested in tax. I, I aced the course, my best grade in the second year of law school. It just shows you what you were saying earlier about your economics teachers. Yes. You get a teacher, however casually, uh, right. to give you some reinforcement, say some nice thing, things about you, even however casually it is, as I say, however casually it is, uh, nevertheless, uh, it, can, it can make a real difference to people. So I'm always, when I teach in class and out of it, I always uh, try to say, not fakely, uh, nice right. thing. If a student right. does a nice job, I say, well done, that sort of thing. Well done, right. So that's an right. answer, a long answer to your question. No, that's great. Were you even asking yourself, I mean, maybe it's, more, maybe, it's, maybe it's a generational difference. Were you asking yourself, is this what I really want to do? Like while you're there at law school, are you checking in internally about your, your no. purpose in life or are you no. just getting through maybe, law maybe school? Maybe a generational thing. Um, I've always been, even growing up at a young age, I've, I've always been much more concerned with doing than with thinking about my identity and yeah. am I happy and all that sort of thing. Long ago, I internalized the proposition that you are most happy assuming you're healthy right. and assuming you've got good family and right. the like, uh, that you're most happy doing something productive and stimulating. So that's what I was doing. I was in law school. Uh, the major change in plans from law school to what happened afterwards, I had come to law school hoping that I would go into criminal law. Well, two things happened. First of all, my criminal law professor was terrible. Interesting. And the second thing that happened was I discovered uh, later on that you needed contacts to go into criminal law. Uh, you usually start off with the uh, state's attorney's office on the state side and you need a political connections in Chicago, especially and probably in most cities uh, mm -hmm. to get jobs. But and you didn't know anybody. And, and I ended up in a small law firm in Chicago for a couple of uh, years. And I, I got some decent training there, corporate law firm. Uh -huh. And that was fine. You still have not found like this area, the specific area of the law right. that you have now devoted 50 years of your life, almost 50 Correct. years of your life to. So. So when did that happen? Uh, here is uh, a kind of amazing story. It shows mm -hmm. you what the role of chance is in life. Yeah. And it's quite scary. I was perusing the Harvard Law School uh, alumni magazine. There was a little notice. We are looking for alums who are interested in getting into teaching. Amazing. A little notice. I wrote to them with, yeah. uh, with your mother's encouragement. I applied, I made a trip out there, I applied, and I got the job with another four or five people called Teaching Fellows, which was a kind of entree into the profession. May I tell you and your audience another weird chance story? Yeah. If, get this now. You heard about my having read the magazine mm -hmm. in 1968 or early 69 about the teaching position available. I was already at Kent Law School in 77 or 78. And then came to my law school in Chicago, a postcard that had been forwarded from Duquesne Law School, a little dinky postcard that came from a law publishing uh, company that said, we are looking for people to write treatises in the area, lots of areas, including civil rights. I responded immediately and I did the treatise in a year and a half, and that got me going. Notice that if this, if this postcard had not been forwarded 
You're right. My life would have been different because I would never have known about the possibility. It's a little scary, but <laughs> uh, you know, the cliche, the cliche is that if you prepare yourself, uh, things can sometimes happen uh, and right. you can jump on them. So that's, that's what I ended up doing. Now, who knows? There might've been another opportunity to do this for another publisher. They may not have gotten anybody for this. I do not know. Was, but, this, uh, was that McGraw Hill? That was very good. That was Shepherd's McGraw Hill. McGraw Hill. Uh, so that became your book. That became my book. Exactly. And we've gone book. through a couple of publishers since that time. Right now, it's the West Group. And uh, as you know, uh, I just completed the 41st update right. of the treatise. Right. And uh, began as about 250 pages. It is now three volumes. And it is about uh, 3,000 or so pages. For those of you watching, this is a book that I remember my dad working on, um, and it was, uh, it's called Section, uh, Civil Rights and Civil Liberties Litigation, The Law of Section 1983, I you believe. You've got it. You've got and it. It was, it was published by McGraw-Hill in, in uh, 79 or 80, maybe? 79 is the year of publication. And, uh, I mean, I assume Jack and David, my brothers would agree, but I mean, I couldn't have been more excited and proud that my dad had a book published. And I still remember that you um, you dedicated it to your family. And I'm pretty sure you said, maybe, maybe it was the second edition, but I feel like it was the first edition where you said something along the lines of, I promised my boys that I would mention them in the, in the, in the credits as partial, if clearly inadequate recompense. Right. Um, and, uh, and I also remember, and I've actually talked about this uh, in probably a concert here and there, I remember going to Washington, D.C. with uh, my grammar school class, and we, one of our stops was at the Library of Congress, and I was uh, not a cool kid, but I became cool for five minutes because I showed them that my dad had a book in the Library of Congress. Well, treated, I remember that. Yeah. And that was neat. Yeah, we looked you up, and there you were. Um, and because of, of that... Uh, I lectured to new federal judges uh, at a time when these federal judges were having uh, receptions and dinners with the United States Supreme Court justices. Right. And you came to one of those. Yes. Didn't you? And you got yourself a tour of uh, Justice White's office and you bonded with Justice White's wife. I remember correctly, right? Uh, I think you're right. Yes, and and he, that's Byron White. Who didn't he write the Roe versus Wade opinion? No, he did no. not. Okay, okay. In fact, uh, interestingly I, enough, I think he dissented. Okay, and we also met. Uh, I remember meeting Justice Breyer. Right. Um, we might have met Justice Ginsburg. You you may have. She was definitely there. Yeah. At at the time. I do want to ask about your your experience uh, arguing a case in front of the Supreme Court. Okay. Because you, for you, it must have felt um, it must have felt like a milestone. I mean, you'd come a long way to to be standing there. So, what was what was that experience? No, that's a, that's a very good question, and it may be a, a neat way, if you want, to end the conversation or continue it, because there is a a payoff <laughs> at the at the end. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, this was early on in the life of the treatise. So in the early 80s, uh, I ended up doing a lot of consulting for a law firm in Puerto Rico, which is in the First Circuit, the United States Court of Appeals for the First Circuit. Anyway, a case that we had won uh, was appealed by the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico, which we had sued, uh, and went all the way up to the United States Supreme Court. If I, and this if, was in, coincidentally, 1983. If I remember, yeah, right. If I remember correctly, it was a, a case that involved a teacher who had been fired because of her political party. Is that right? Exactly right. Uh, okay. This was actually more than 100 teachers who had been fired. And it was a technical question involving statutes of limitation right, because right. the Commonwealth argued that they had filed their lawsuits too late. Too late. Okay. And if they win on that, you never get to the merits of, of the case. In mm -hmm. any event- mm -hmm. uh, Right. If, if they're too late, then it's then, it's over. then no complaint. No right. remedy. It's o right. over. Okay. Uh, so I'm arguing before the Supreme Court, and it is a, a very intense and heady experience. 
if any of your viewers have been in the Supreme Court, and I recommend going there, taking a little tour, if you haven't been there yet, uh, the justices sit in a semicircle. They mm -hmm. are closer to you than you would think, uh, with the chief justice in the middle and uh, the other justices along the side in the semicircle. So you're up, uh, up close. Who them. was the chief justice at the time? Chief justice was Chief Justice Warren Berger, a very handsome man with uh, a head of gray hair uh, that I could kill for right, at this right. point. And he always set off his gray hair with a beautiful red tie. Okay. All right. So he was the chief. And, and this, other justices there, this was uh, uh, Justice Marshall and Justice Brennan and uh, Sandra Day O'Connor Stevens, Sandra Day O'Connor mm -hmm. was there. Um, White was there as well, Rehnquist, mm -hmm. before he became the Chief Justice. Uh, so these were uh, nine justices. And you and have 30 minutes, right? So I have 30 minutes, and it's what they call a hot court. Uh, people uh, in your audience should know that a good oral argument is never a lecture. The justices have read the briefs. I wrote the briefs. The justices have read the briefs and they have questions for you. Mm -hmm. And they will ask you those questions and you had better be prepared with those questions uh, for those questions and for the answers. And then very often one justice will interrupt you in your answer mm -hmm. and other justices will, will chime in. Uh, and it went very well. No complaints with how it went because as it turns out, I won the case six to three. Mm -hmm. But here is the funny story. Mm -hmm. In the middle of the oral argument, Justice Stevens asks me a question. And Justice Stevens, uh, it's a fairly complicated question, but again, by that time, they knew that I knew what was going on. Uh, and everything was going beautifully. Justice Stevens asked me a complicated question and I did something you never do in the United States Supreme Court. I remember. Yeah, I know you do. It's actually audio taped, it's in the archives. Mm -hmm. Anybody can get it. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, Justice Stevens, and so I say Justice Stevens, how so, your honor? So Justice Stevens uh, is taken aback a little bit because I'm, I'm basically asking the, what, you know, what he's specifically asking me about. Uh, and I will never forget, to his credit, Justice Rehnquist, who ruled against me. He was one of the three dissenters. He leaned over and said, Mr. Neymar, in this court, we asked the questions. <laughs> and everybody started laughing, mm -hmm. including, by the way, Sandra Day O'Connor, who had been grim-faced all the way through. So mm -hmm. I, I, I kind of smiled. I said, uh, my apologies to the court and uh, Justice Stevens, I meant no disrespect, but I am a law professor and I'm accustomed to asking questions as well. And everybody cracked up even more so than earlier when there were just titters, when uh, Justice Rehnquist leaned over and said, we asked the questions. Mm -hmm. uh, and everybody breathed a sigh of relief. I went on to answer Justice Stevens' question. Mm -hmm. uh, hopefully to his satisfaction. And here's the kicker. Not only did I win, but guess who wrote the opinion for us? Justice Stevens. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that was exciting. I've argued yeah. in uh, courts of appeals, oh, maybe eight or 10 times uh, around the country, but that you can't go wrong with a Supreme Court argument, especially when it goes well. Uh, and if you are fortunate enough to win as well. So you remember that, but it's a, it's a, Terrific, terrific story, in my the view. Family, yeah, the whole family went out to watch you argue that case. Sure did. Sure yeah, did. that was amazing, amazing experience, yeah. Uh, so the last question I'll ask you then is, um, so you, you uh, f fell into this area of expertise that you have lasered, focused on for, decades, right? Consulted people all across the country in Puerto Rico on, on constitutional rights. You have defended 
American constitutional rights in courtrooms and in writing. And yeah. you have opinions, even if you don't impart them in your classroom, you have opinions and you assert them and you put them on your blog. So what does your body of work say? Like if you were to put a headline on the biography of your professional life, yeah. what's what's been your principal um, theme or message? I'm an educator first and foremost. Okay. And that includes not only the teaching in the classroom, but also everything I've written. That's all educational in nature. And I focused on section 1983 in part initially by chance, but now because of, of, of love uh, and uh, a view of its importance, because it is to go back to what I said at the beginning, it's the 14th amendment in action. Mm -hmm. It's law in action. It's, the, it's constitutional accountability in action which is why uh, I look so askance at what's happening uh, with Section 1983 in certain circumstances. I think uh, it, it is a radical civil rights statute. Mm -hmm. And it's not only become much less radical as interpreted by our Supreme Court, I think poorly and badly, yeah. but it's also, uh, you know, it's, it's not even middle of the road anymore. It's become a little too pro-defendant, and that was never the intent of the 42nd Congress in 1871. So we've lost the thrust of Section 1980. It's still there. Obviously, I got these three volumes, 300 pages, 3,000 pages, but it, it could have been, and maybe it one day will be much more. Does, yeah, does the pendulum swing? Uh, it does, but slowly, what did mm -hmm. uh, Martin Luther King Jr. say about the arc of justice? Right. It bends, bends slowly. And slowly. So, so does this, and given what's going on, uh, for better or worse, in the Supreme Court, uh, it will be a while before things can change. Uh, well, Professor Namod slash dad, thank you for uh, a really fascinating conversation. And, uh, you know, personally, I'm always uh, so proud of the work you've done. And uh, I'll never forget that visit to the Supreme Court and uh, to the uh, Library of Congress. And I love the stand you take on, on civil rights. And, uh, you know, we, we, we talk about the fact that we live in a free country, right? Um, and in a democracy and so on, and the beauty of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence and so on. But the truth is that, uh, that every, every freedom we actually have um, has been defended <laughs> by smart people with pens and paper, uh, right? And this, I mean, these things have to be, uh, just like wars defend borders, our rights have been defended by lawyers, right. essentially. And, and people with judges. guts, people with guts don't forget. Right, right, because it is controversial. It picks enemies and picks fights. You right. lose probably as many as you win, I would think, and there's always a pushback. Um, and uh, so I think it's pretty powerful and profound what you've done. I, I really I do. I appreciate that. Daniel Neymar slash son, thank you for interviewing me. And keep up, the, keep up the beautiful work. My pleasure. Yeah, okay. thanks, Dad. All right. Bye, son. Bye, everybody.